Good morning everyone. I will be presenting the admission rounds from Pediatric Hematology Oncology Unit. Our learning objectives will be uh, differential diagnosis of cervical lymphadenopathy and basics of management of Hodgkin's lymphoma. We have Master P who is 5 years, resident of Nevada District, Bihar. He is fourth born child to a non consensually married couple. He present to us with chief complaints of swelling over the left side of the neck for the past 8 months. Child was apparently well till 8 months back when they noticed a small swelling which was noted on the left side of the neck. The swelling gradually increased in size to reach the current size. It was a painless swelling and did not have any skin changes or discharge. Initially he was managed on outpatient basis before being referred to PGI. There was no history of any fever, no history of night sweats, no history of weight loss and he did not have any significant systemic symptoms. Past history was not contributory and birth history was uneventful. He was fourth born child, developmentally normal and immunized for age. General examination, his vitals were stable and anthropometrically he was within normal limits. He had multiple cervical lymph nodes involving level 2 to 5 which were enlarged on the left side and the largest measuring around 7 to 6 centimeters. The skin over the swelling is normal. There was no tenderness or local rise of temperature and consistency was rubbery. It was not mated and it was not mobile. And on oral examination, there was no tonsillar enlargement. He had mild pallor. However, there was no ictus, cyanosis, clubbing, edema. There was no petechiae, ecchymosis or bony tenderness. There was no distended veins noted over the neck or face. There was no facial or upper limb swelling and there was no cutaneous stigmata of TB or HIV. Systemic examination, per abdomen examination did not reveal any hepatosplenomically and rest of the systemic examination was within normal. So we have fire boy who presented with chronic painless cervical lymphadenopathy with no B symptoms and there was no history of contact with TB or no history of uh, recurrent blood transfusions. He did not have any pallor or bleeding manifestations or hepatosplenomically. Coming to lymphadenopathy, it is considered significant when size of the lymph nodes are more than 1 cm in case of cervical and axillary region and more than 1.5 cm in inguinal region. When epitrochlear and supracapitular nodes are involved, then it is considered significant. And when it is mated and fixed, we consider it as significant lymphadenopathy. We call it generalized when two or more non contiguous lymph nodes are involved and chronicity when four or more weeks are is the duration of symptoms. And in index child, he had cervical lymphadenopathy, which was fixed and the duration was more than four weeks. Coming to the differential diagnosis in the index child, uh, infection was first possibility kept mainly HIV and TB. However, uh, points against where there was no history of any weight loss, there was no opportunistic infection in the child and there was no history of contact with TB. There is no hepatosplenomegaly or respiratory involvement. Second possibility that we considered was lymphoma as the child had chronic painless progressive lymphadenopathy and there was no feature suggestive of bone marrow infiltration or failure. Points against being there was no night sweats, weight loss or fever. Leukemia was down the cuts as the duration of symptoms was very chronic and there was no fever or hepatosplenomegaly associated. Rare possibilities like Kikuchi disease were also kept but there was no history of any weight loss, fever or systemic involvement in this case. We went ahead with baseline investigations which revealed elevated ESR. However, there were no signs of tumor lysis syndrome. Uh, ultrasound abdomen was normal and chest x-ray did not show any mediastinal widening. We went ahead with uh, corneal aspiration from the lymph node which showed scattered large atypical lymphoid cells which are 3 to 5 times the size of mature lymphocyte having fine chromatin and prominent nucleoli and moderate amount of cytoplasm. They can be both mono or binucleated in an inflammatory background. They were CD15, 30 and PAXY positive, suggestive of classical Hodgkin's lymphoma. And here is the representative image of the same. For the staging, we went ahead with FDG PET CT, which showed FDG avid enlarged discrete to conglomerated cervical and supraclavicular lymph nodes. However, 
none of the other areas showed FDD avid areas. Coming to pediatric lymphomas, it is the more, third most common malignancy in children and most common malignancy in adolescents. There are two groups, Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's. Hodgkin's usually present in second decade, whereas non-Hodgkin's presents in first decade. Coming to the main differences between Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's, Hodgkin is a malignancy that originates from the germinal center, whereas non-Hodgkin's is monoclonal proliferation of B or T lymphocytes. Hodgkin's have contiguous lymph node spreads, whereas non-Hodgkin's will have a systemic disease. The histologically, they are classified into two types. One is classical, and other one is nodular lymphocyte predominant type. Non-Hodgkin is divided into four. One is DLBCL, Burkitt lymphoma, lymphoblastic lymphoma, and anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Usually, Hodgkin's presents as cervical lymphadenopathy, whereas non-Hodgkin's, it depends on the type. Burkitt's usually have abdominal involvement, and DLBCL usually presents with mediastinal widening. Anaplastic large cell, they present with generalized lymphadenopathy with skin and bone involvement, whereas lymphoblastic lymphoma usually have systemic symptoms and they can overlap with leukemia. Coming to the prognosis, usually Hodgkin's has very good prognosis with more than 90% survival rate, whereas uh, non-Hodgkin's, it depends on the type of NHL. Hodgkin's was initially described, this is Sir Thomas Hodgkin, who made the initial description of the disease. Uh, later on, the microscopic uh, image and description of the tumor cell was given by Reed and Sternberg. They originate from the B cells that are proliferating in the germinal matrix with overall survival of more than 90%. Even relapsed Hodgkin patients, they can be effectively salvaged. So the different types of Hodgkin's lymphoma being classical and nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin's lymphoma. Classical is divided into four subtypes. Nodular sclerosis, which is the most common type overall. However, in India, we see mixed cellularity as most common type. The other two types being lymphocyte rich and lymphocyte predominant. Usually, CD15, 30, and Pax5 are positive in case of classical Hodgkin's lymphoma. Nodular lymphocyte predominant type has excellent prognosis with the response to chemotherapy, and it is curable even with surgical excision or local radiotherapy and they are usually positive for CD20 and CD45. Coming to the clinical manifestation, they generally present with painless progressive cervical lymphadenopathy. Associated B symptoms may or may not be present. However, presence of B symptoms has prognostic significance. Superior medial syndrome can occur, but however, it is extremely rare, and hepatosplenomegaly is usually seen in case of advanced disease. Routine investigations like complete blood count, ESR, and tumor lysis workup is done along with chest X-ray and USG abdomen. Our tissue diagnosis is done with the help of excisional biopsy or multiple core needle biopsies with histological and immunohistochemistry. FNAC is usually inferior to biopsy as Hodgkin's is a polycellular disease. PET CT is done both for staging as well as reassessment after chemotherapy, and we use dual score in case of response assessment. The staging of Hodgkin's lymphoma is done based on anabolic staging, where it is divided into four. Stage one involves single group of lymph nodes. Stage two, two or more lymph nodes are involved on the same side of the diaphragm. And stage three involves lymph nodes on both sides of the diaphragm, and stage four involves Externodal sites beyond E sites. E sites refers to involvement of external sites, which are contiguous to the nodal site involvement. And based on presence or absence of B symptoms, they are subdivided into A and B. Management usually chemotherapy is highly effective, and many chemotherapy regimens are available. However, we resort to those chemotherapy regimens that has less long-term complications. In our unit, we follow Uranet PHLC1 protocol, in which two cycles of OEPA is given, vincristine, etoposide, prednisolone, and artiamycin, followed by COPDAC, which is cyclophosphamide, vincristine, prednisolone, and dacarbacin. Radiotherapy, we go ahead if there is poor response to chemotherapy after response assessment with PET. 
So our unit's final diagnosis is classical Hodgkin's lymphoma, stage 1A. The index child, the plan is to give two cycles of OEPA and do the response assessment with FDG PET. If there is favorable response, then we go ahead with two cycles of chemo. If there is unfavorable response, then radiotherapy is considered after two cycles of chemo. Our index stage is having currently undergoing course one and there are no treatment related toxicities yet. These are the unit publications. This is to highlight these two studies are 10 years apart. The overall survival rate, however, remains almost more than 90% with whatever regimen that we, we are using. Hence, uh, emphasizing on the excellent prognosis of uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma with chemotherapy. Take home messages, Hodgkin's lymphoma is an indolent disease with excellent survival rate, including after relapse. As Hodgkin's lymphoma is a posicellular tumor, adequate tissue sampling and detailed histopathological evaluation is essential for diagnosis. FDG PET is the modality of choice for staging as well as response assessment to chemotherapy. Since it is eminently curable malignancy, the emphasis in pediatric Hodgkin's is to reduce the long-term complications. Why the senior agent for his comments? Good morning. Uh, through this presentation, we wanted to highlight the differences between Hodgkin's lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, and we also wanted to highlight the fact that Hodgkin's lymphoma being a postcellular disease, the diagnosis may sometimes be delayed, especially in peripheral settings. So adequate tissue sampling and a detailed histopathological examination is important. And Hodgkin's lymphoma is an excellent, uh, has, is a malignancy with excellent prognosis. So all efforts must be made to treat the child, uh, treat the patients. Uh, even relapse patients. Thank you. Okay. Now we can have comments from the junior agents first. Again, this is a very common problem in the OPD. You are dealing with lymphadenopathies and you have to make differences. Yes, please. Yes, sir. Uh, so classical Hodgkin's lymphoma, the subtype doesn't affect the therapy. All of them receive the same chemotherapy regimens. But nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin's lymphoma is much more indolent than classical Hodgkin's. If it is completely resectable, we can even avoid radiotherapy. There are specific indications just to give chemotherapy. Most of the time, we can avoid chemotherapy also. Okay. So is there any difference in the prognosis of those four subtypes of the classical? Sir, so uh, like uh, that, the common one, which is nodular sclerosis all over the world, which is it's more common through in the second decade of life, whereas the mixed cellularity, which is more common in the developing nations such as India, comes slightly earlier in life and is supposed to have a marginally inferior prognosis, but not much difference between the other subtypes. Okay. Yeah, Karthi. <clears throat> Sir, uh, regarding the infectious workup, so HIV we do get done uh, for all children uh, for malignancy. We need to have a baseline documentation also. It may have treatment implications. The others such as EBV in Hodgkin's lymphoma is usually a secondary insult. So it doesn't affect the therapy. It is the guidelines don't mandate the uh, screening for viral markers uh, uh, such as EBV. Now, uh, in our unit or in our uh, institute, since we have good cytopathologists, we often get a diagnosis through FNAC itself. Most of the time, we don't have to resort to uh, true cut biopsy. But if a small lymph node is there, uh, especially in the cervical region, unguided biopsy may be difficult, in which case uh, sometimes we do an uh, image-guided uh, true cut biopsy. For, uh, now, uh, to see Dr. Anmol has started doing here, we don't have to send to Nehru also. Uh, and whenever we are doing image guided, we do both FNSE and biopsy together. The advantage with FNSE will be that within one day we get the diagnosis. With biopsy, we have to wait for one week. So if we have to make that effort, we do both of them together. Otherwise, uh, FNSE usually gives the diagnosis. 
Yes. So ferritin in this, uh, we don't uh, we don't look for. It doesn't have much prognostic significance, but he highlighted ESR. So this patient was like high ESR and high volume increases the risk uh, slightly, and we uh, upstage the treatment. Okay. Any more comments, Dr. Amita, please. Any more comments? So if there is none, we will move to the second case. Thank you. Second case is from Pediatric Gastroenterology. It will be presented by Dr. Mithun. Good morning to all. I am presenting the admission rounds from the Department of Pediatric Gastroenterology. The learning objectives for this session will be diagnosis and management of acute pancreatitis in children and the management of pancreatic pseudocyst. We have Ms. S, a six-year-old female child, a resident of Ludhiana, who was admitted with us from 9th to 17th of May. She had a history of fall from steps of about two to three steps height, following which she had acute onset abdominal pain, which was more in the upper abdomen, but generalized, severe and non-radiating, lasting for hours, with some improvement with IV and LJ6 and it was aggravated on food intake. There was also non-bilious and non-projectile vomiting, consisting mainly of ingested food particles. She had reduced oral intake mainly due to fear of pain abdomen, and there was a history of weight loss of 2 kg over one month. There was a gradually progressive abdominal distension, which was involving mainly the upper abdomen. There was no history of constipation, loose stools or worms in stool, no history of jaundice, no history of drug intake or toxin ingestion, no history of bleeding manifestations, no history of cough or breathing difficulty or reduced urine output, and there was no similar episode in the past. For these complaints, she was admitted to ESI hospital in Ludhiana, where a USC abdomen showed edematous pancreatis, pancreas with mild ascites. She was uh, treated with I IV fluids and analgesics. However, in view of no response, she was uh, referred to PGI on day 30 of illness. Family history, she was, born to, she was second born to a non-consanguineous couple. There was no family history of uh, recurrent attacks of abdominal pain or gallstones or insulin-dependent diabetes. Birth history, developmental history, and socioeconomic history are non-contributory. On examination, she had tachy tachycardia and mild tachypnea. Vitals were within normal limits. There was uh, some dehydration in the form of sunken eyes and dry mucosa. Anthropometry-wise, she had wasting and other parameters were within normal limits. On abdominal examination, upper abdomen was distended. There was an epigastric swelling, which was present extending up to left hypochondrium and left iliac region. There was tenderness to palpation and guarding present over the same areas. On percussion, there was dull note over the swelling and there was shifting dullness. Bubble sounds were present on auscultation. Other systems examination within, were within normal limits. In database, we have a six-year-old female child who presented to us with a history of blunt abdominal trauma following which there was pain, abdomen, and vomiting, and gradually progressive abdominal distension. There was history of uh, poor appetite and weight loss. On examination, there was wasting, a tender swelling in the epigastric, left hypochondrial, and left iliac region, along with ascites. So the unit's provisional diagnosis with, was acute pancreatitis with a peripancreatic collection with symptoms of gastric compression in the form of poor appetite and weight loss with the etiology of trauma. Coming to a discussion of acute pancreatitis in children, as per the INSPIRE criteria, to make a diagnosis of acute pancreatitis, we should meet at least two out of the following three criteria. First is an abdominal pain that is compatible with acute pancreatitis, which will be discussed later. 
serum amylase or lipase values more than three times the upper limit of normal and imaging findings that are consistent with acute pancreatitis. This is the Western data for the etiology. So in this we can see that biliary causes and uh, medications are the most common causes in the Western world. In the age group of less than two years, uh, uh, systemic illness also uh, contributes to the etiology, whereas in older children it is uh, biliary causes as well as uh, drugs. Coming to Indian data, in our institute, trauma, biliary and infections form the major chunk of the etiology. With upcoming NGS and uh, endoscopic ultrasound, the proportion of idiopathic cases is expected to come down in the near future. These are the other etiologies. In biliary causes, we have colidocal cyst, abnormal union of the pancreatobiliary junctions, gallstones and biliary sludge, viral and bacterial infections, drugs uh, mainly ls paraginase and valproate, trauma, systemic diseases like vasculitis and inflammatory disorders, hypertriglyceridemia and hypercalcemia among the metabolic causes. Clinical features, abdominal pain is the most common symptom which the patients present with. However, in less than two, in the age group of below two years, only 43% of the patients present with abdominal pain, leading to a delay in diagnosis. Whereas in children, more than 80% present with abdominal pain. However, other signs which are commonly seen in adults like guarding and uh, nausea, vomiting, abdominal distension are, uh, less, are seen in a lesser proportion in children compared to that of adults. The pain in acute pancreatitis, it is often poorly localized in children. It may be epigastric in the right hypochondrium or the left hypochondrium depending on the area of involvement and rarely it may also be seen in the lower abdomen when there is exudation to the left colon. It sharply maximizes in 10 to 20 minutes and stays for hours steady and unrelating. It is a deep and boring pain that uh, may radiate to the back and the patient often sits hunched forwards. To make a diagnosis, we depend on the pancreatic enzymes that is amylase and lipase. We keep a cutoff of three times the upper limit of normal. Lipase is the first to rise in four, four to eight hours. It plateaus from day one to day eight and then normalizes by day 14. Amylase uh, rises slightly later, plateaus by three to five days and uh, normalizes by day eight. So in a case of uh, delayed presentation, lipase has a greater value than amylase. USG is the imaging of choice and often there is no indication for any further imaging, especially in cases of mild pancreatitis and radiation exposure is of concern in, in these patients. Further imaging is uh, indicated only when there is any ambiguity in the clinical scenario in order to differentiate it from other acute abdominal conditions. In a severe acute pancreatitis, which is not improving and when we are suspecting complications, and in a polytrauma patient to rule out uh, other organ injury, where CT becomes the modality of choice. In our index child, the hemogram was nearly normal and biochemistry showed hypoalbuminemia with elevated CRP and elevated amylase and lipase. USC showed a diffusely heterogenic pancreas with 7.8 cross 5.7 centimeter collection in the lesser sac with moderate ascites. We went ahead to do a CECT in order to plan an intervention in this child. So in this uh, CECT, we can uh, see a hypodense collection that is seen in the lesser sac and it's compressing the stomach. In this uh, coronal section, we can see the collection that is uh, compressing the stomach and uh, responsible for symptoms. This image shows a transection uh, at the level of the neck, which is communicating with the collection along with gross ascites. To grade the severity of acute pancreatitis, we need to look for any organ dysfunction in the form of ca cardiovascular like shock, renal, which is AKI, or ARDS pulmonary. If any organ dysfunction is uh, present, uh, we need to see if it's a transient dysfunction or a persistent dysfunction. If it's persistent, then it's a severe acute pancreatitis. Transient organ dysfunction means uh, acute, moderately severe acute pancreatitis. In the absence of any organ dysfunction, we need to look for any local or systemic complications or any exacerbation of any prior existing comorbidities. In the presence of complications, it is a moderately severe acute pancreatitis. And in the absence of any complications, it's a mild acute pancreatitis. In our index case, there was no organ dysfunction, but there was a local complication in the form of a pseudocyst. Hence, we classified it as a moderately severe acute pancreatitis. So coming to the management of acute pancreatitis, the initial priority is to collect, correct the volume status of the child. There are several factors which contribute to hypovolemia in a setting of acute pancreatitis, which is vomiting, reduced oral intake, third space losses, respiratory losses, as well as diaphoresis. Hypovolemia can lead to complications like AKI and pancreatic uh, hypoperfusion, which in turn leads to necrosis. 
So we target to keep the patient euvolemic in the first 48 to 72 hours. The initial resuscitation fluid is crystalloids, either ring lactate or normal serine. If the patient is hemodynamically compromised, a fluid bolus of 10 to 20 ml per kg can also be given. In the initial 24 to 48 hours, 1.5 to 2 times maintenance IV fluids is given, following which we come down to normal maintenance IV fluids. For analgesia, we follow the WHO step ladder pattern, starting with non-opioids and then moving up to weak opioids and then strong opioids. For the nutrition, enteral feeding should be initiated as early as possible. In a mild acute pancreatitis, once the vomiting is resolved, we should attempt to start oral feeds, starting with a low-fat and low-residue diet and a soft diet which can be compared to clear liquids. Even in severe acute pancreatitis, once the ileus is resolved, uh, we can start enteral feeds. Nasogastric as well as nasojejunal feeds has, have been proved to have a compared efficacy, comparable efficacy and uh, safety. Prolonged NPO in these patients should be avoided. It can lead to intestinal mucosal atrophy and in increased infectious complications due to bacterial translocation. Early enteral feeding has the following benefits in the form of shorter hospital stay, decreased infectious complications and decreased modalities. Antibiotics have a role only in a case of uh, infected pancreatic necrosis or extra pancreatic infections and uh, they do not have any role even if the patient is febrile. It is a common finding in the first week due to SIRS and there is no role of antibiotics just by the presence of fever and there is no role of antioxidants, protease inhibitors or probiotics in any setting. Classification of uh, pancreatic fluid collections. The name of the classification is a uh, revised Atlanta classification. If uh, necrosis is present, then it's a necrotizing pancreatitis. In the absence of uh, necrosis, it's interstitial edematous pancreatitis. The necrotic collection of more than four weeks of duration is called a walled off necrosis. Less than four weeks, it's an acute necrotic collection. In the absence of necrosis, a collection of uh, more than four weeks is a pseudocyst and a less than and that which is less than four weeks is an acute peripancreatic fluid collection. In our index case, uh, there was no necrosis and the duration of uh, symptoms was more than four weeks. Hence, we classified it as a pancreatic pseudocyst. Management of a pseudocyst, treatment is indicated only when the pseudocyst is symptomatic or infected. Symptoms can be in the form of pain abdomen or due to compression of the adjacent organs like stomach, which we had in our index case. There are various treatment modalities commonly used as our uh, transmural drainage where we can uh, do an endoscopic cystogastrostomy or a cystoduodenostomy, a transpapillary drainage by endoscopic sphincterotomy and uh, balloon dilatation, a surgical drainage is rarely needed. Uh, from the data in our institute, out of the 62 cases with pancreatic fluid collections, among pseudocysts only 18.2% required drainage whereas the rest of them resolve spontaneously without any intervention. Even in walled off necrosis, 35.7% required drainage and the rest resolve spontaneously and the median time for resolution was four months. So this uh, implies that uh, if the patient is asymptomatic, no intervention is needed in any pancreatic fluid collection and we, we should wait for spontaneous resolution. In the index case, IV fluids were given. Analgis for analgesia, we initially started with paracetamol and then moved up to diclofenac and tramadol for adequate pain control. For the pseudocyst, we went ahead with endoscopic cystogastrostomy on day four of hospital stay. NG feeds were in initiated, initially clu clear fluids, and then uh, a low-fat diet was initiated. In this, uh, we f for uh, endoscopic cystogastrostomy, we first pass an endoscope to the cavity of the stomach. We puncture the posterior wall of the stomach, pass a needle into the cyst cavity, and through the needle, we then insert a guide wire and uh, then dilate the tract that is formed. And through the dilated tract, we insert a pigtail catheter. So this uh, ultrasound image shows the needle that has been passed into the cyst cavity. Then a guide wire was passed, the tract was dilated, and a double pigtail catheter was inserted. Another double pigtail catheter was inserted to achieve adequate drainage. The final diagnosis of the unit is a first episode of acute pancreatitis, moderately severe, with a local complication of duct disruption, duct disruption at the level of neck, with pseudocyst and ascites, with no systemic complications, with etiology of trauma. Currently, the child is pain-free, having a good oral intake, gaining weight without ascites or residual collections. So the take-home messages in this case are, for the initial imaging, an ultrasound would suffice and uh, no further imaging is required. Early aggressive fluid management is the backbone of acute pancreatitis management in the early acute phase. 
early enteral nutrition should be initiated irrespective of type or route. Optimum pain relief may require uh, judicious use of opioids. Intense monitoring in the first 48 hours is crucial. Pancreatic pseudosis should be managed uh, only if uh, symptomatic or infected. Thank you.